push against the idea that you can grow your way out of a deficit. What does history tell us? Well, uh, it's good economics. Uh, Reagan tried it, Bush tried it, and this time around, look at the latest number. Uh, the deficit since last year has already in August doubled. And it's going to double because you have a $2 trillion budget deficit. Next year, we're going to have a budget deficit that's going to be overall $1 trillion. The deficit, we're going to add to the public debt $1 trillion per year for the, as far as the eye can see. So it's totally voodoo economics. Of course, you cut taxes. There is some short-run improvement in, in uh, growth, but it's going to be minimal. The CBO estimates over a decade, 0.1% increase in GDP level, okay, there's nothing, it's close to zero. Then you'll have a fiscal drag through the effect on long-term short rates and the dollar. There's be a crowding out of that growth. And to contain it, then they have to increase rapidly taxes on the household sector starting in 2024. So there'll be a massive drag starting then, but there'll be already fiscal drag in 2020. The economy is growing now three rather than two, because this year and next year there's a fiscal stimulus. By 2020, that stimulus becomes a small fiscal drag. So not only are we going to go from three to two, we're going to go below two. We're going to go towards 1.8. So it's an artificial fiscal stimulus, unsustainable. Okay, peacetime, first time ever, during not a recession, and it's going to crowd out economic growth over time. What does that mean for yields, Nouriel, Treasury yields? Well, over time, the combination of U.S. monetary policy and the Fed tightening and this fiscal stimulus implies that long-term interest rates have gone higher, and they're going to keep on going higher. Now, what keeps the lead right now on long-term trades in the U.S. is that while the Fed controls the short end of the yield curve, ECB, BOJ, and other central banks are controlling the long term of the yield curve because there is still unconventional policies in other parts of the world. But guess what? The ECB decided we're going to finish QE and then start normalizing rate next year. Other central banks in Europe are going to do the same thing. Therefore, global liquidity is going to start to shrink. And therefore, once that happens and you still have the stimulus, U.S. long-term interest rates are going to tend to go higher. Short as going Going higher, the dollar is going to strengthen, the current account deficit is going to become higher, and therefore there'll be a crowding out by late next year of that economic recovery into a fiscal drag in 2020, into a tightening by the Fed towards 3.5%, that they have to go towards 3.5% because the fiscal theme also leads to an overheating of the economy, and that uh, tighter fiscal policy and tighter monetary policy could plunge the economy into a stall by 2020 if you add the net trade frictions, the capital market frictions, the fact there'll be a slowdown in emerging market in Europe, in China, and the fact that asset prices, as we know, are fraughty. Uh, uh, profit and P ratios are 50% higher than historical average. So when the market see the slowdown occurring into 2020, there'll be a market correction that's going to have a negative wealth effect. So you might have by 2020 a perfect storm for the U.S. and the global economy. Okay, will the central bank have enough tools to deal with this perfect storm if we were to have it by 2020? I think there are differences this time around is that we are having policies that are stagflationary, that reduce growth, but they also increase inflation. For the last decade, all the shocks were stuck deflationary, meaning lower growth, lower inflation, and therefore central banks were doing even more and doubling down on more unconventional policies. But if you're going to have trade restriction, if you are going to have restriction to capital flows, if you're going to have restrictions to FDI and technology transfers, if you're going to have restriction to migration, if you're not going to invest into renewable resources, if you're not going to invest into infrastructure and there is no plan, all those shocks are stagflationary, are going to reduce growth, are going to force inflation higher. And when that happens, when the economy is overheating, that's going to force the Fed to hike more faster and sooner rather than ease as it happens whenever you have had a, a policy shock that has been stagflationary, like the all shock 73, 79, 1990, because if you don't tighten, inflation expectations go higher, and then you're in a worse situation. So the type of policy that is going to be followed by the U.S. are going to imply forcing the Fed to have to tighten rather than ease, even if growth slows down, because inflation and inflation expectations are going to go higher. That's a difference in the ability and willingness of the Fed and other central banks to react to that economic slowdown. It's driven by negative supply-side shocks.